In this section, we talk about Git. While going through DevOps or cloud courses, you will often come across situations where you will have to download source codes of applications or sample configuration files or playbooks, etc. And all of these are usually done with Git. So Git is a must-have skill in today's world, and it's not just for developers. It is for anyone from system administrators to customer support professionals to project managers. In this section, we will understand what Git is and what it is used for. We will see how to install and get started with Git. We will see what Git repositories are and what are remote repositories, how to clone remote repositories, and make changes to them, and pull or push to remote repositories. We will also answer some of the frequently asked questions like the difference between Git and GitHub. Our goal is to give you enough basics to be able to download source code of an application and if you're required to make changes to it and make your changes available on the remote repositories. And also gain some hands-on experience with our labs and get comfortable with it. So let's get started. We talked about applications a lot during this course. Here's my little Python application. It's a web server developed with Flask. It's actually very simple. There are only a few files in it, a license file, a readme file, a requirements.txt file, and the main.py file. And my code in the main.py file is just about 15 to 20 lines long. A very simple application and a very easy code. So that's me working on the file. If I were to modify a line of code in this file, I would always remember what that is. But what if I made changes more often? I would eventually have no idea what was changed and when. A few months from now, I want to be able to know what part of the code was modified and when. I want to be able to track every time something changes. Secondly, what happens when my application gets really big? when there are many more files and multiple developers working on it at the same time. You want multiple developers to be able to work on the same project or same files even without stepping on each other's toes and be able to track changes of who made what changes and when. And that's where source control management systems come in. They help manage source code of applications each change to a file or a group of files creates a new version of the application. So they are also known as version control systems. There are many version control systems out there and Git is one of the most popular ones. Let's see how it works. Git helps in tracking changes to a set of files in a directory as well as helps multiple developers merge their work together. Currently, the files under my application are not being tracked and we want Git to help us track it. So how do we bring it under Git's control? Git refers to a directory under its control as a source code repository. So the first step is to convert our directory into a Git repository. It's called initializing a Git repository. I'll explain how it is done in a few minutes, but first I want to go over the high level flow. We then decide what files we need to track. You can either track all the files in a directory or choose to track only specific files. For example, I'd like to track all files except the personal notes file that I have created. I don't want to track the changes on that. So that's the next step. Configure files to track. Once you configure the files to track, Git starts tracking changes to those files. Every time you modify a file and tell Git that you're done uh, modifying the file, Git creates a new version with the changes that you made. Now remember, Git does not create a new version each time you save your file. You must tell Git explicitly that you're done making the set of changes. And that's called committing changes. The change could be as small as modifying a single character in the file to as big as changing the entire file or even multiple files. You can also make changes to multiple files at a time and ask Git to commit those changes together. You don't have to commit all changes at once either. For instance, say you made changes to two of these files, the utils file and the db file. 
You're sure you're done with the changes on the utils file, but not on the DB file. You can configure to commit only the utils uh, file by placing it into a staging area. A staging area is where files ready to be committed are placed. When you commit a Git repository, only the files in the staging area are committed. Once the file is placed in the staging area, when you commit, a new version is created with the changes from only that file. Let's go back and see how to get started and what are the commands to be used. The first step, of course, even before all of these, is to install Git on your system if you haven't already installed it. On CentOS systems, to install Git, run the yum install git command. For instructions on installing Git on all other systems, use the link given here. Once installed, git is the command line utility used to perform git related tasks. Running the git version command returns the version of git installed. The next step is to initialize a git repository. For that, run the git init command. It says initialized an empty git repository under our current directory. When git initializes a repository, it creates a hidden directory named .git under the current directory. It's inside that directory where Git stores all information related to the changes on these files. Next, we must configure the files to track. But before that, we can check the status of our Git repository currently using the git status command. It gives me a list of untracked files, which happens to be all of the files in my current directory. And that's true because we have not configured any files to track. Now I want to track all my files except the notes.txt file. For this, we run the git add command and specify the list of files that I wish to track. Running the git status command now shows that all files except the notes.txt file are tracked and are ready to be committed. Whenever a change is made to a file, git now keeps a track of it and marks that file as modified. Running the git status command, now shows that the main.py file has now been modified and that the changes are not staged for commit. The next step is to stage the changes for commit. For this, we again use the same git add command we used earlier. This time, it stages the changes and marks them ready for a commit operation. Running the git status command again shows us that all files are now staged. So the way the git add command works is if you run this command against a file that is not being tracked, as all these files were in the beginning, it tracks these files and stages them at the same time. Whenever you modify any of these files, they are unstaged and they go back to a modified state. Running the git add command on a tracked but an unstaged file stages the file and adds it to the list of files to be committed. The next step is to commit the changes. To commit changes, run the git commit command and provide a commit message using the dash m option. If you do not specify the m option, then git will open an editor for you to type the message in. The commit message should directly indicate what changes you have made to your code. Since this is the first time we are committing our code, we will just call it the initial commit. But going forward, we will make sure each commit has a message that tells exactly the nature of change that was made. Once committed, Git creates a new version of the repository with the changes. Let's continue with our discussion on Git. When we initialized a Git repository, we did it in our own system. Now this could be on our laptop. So that's called a local Git repository because it's local to our laptop. We also talked about multiple users working on the same source code at the same time. Now, that does not mean that they are all working on the same system. Of course, they are all working on their own systems with their own local Git repository containing a copy of the application files. While I'm working on the main file on my laptop, Mark is also working on the main file as well as the DB file, and Aditi is working on the cache file, and Lee is working on the backend file. Once we are all done with our changes, how do we put them all together? 
For that, we need a central location where all the changes can be pushed to. So that's a remote Git repository. This could be a repository hosted within your network or anywhere on the internet. Now, all the different members in the team can push their changes to the remote repository, and all the changes would be merged together at the remote site. Now, you might be wondering what happens if multiple users modify the same file? Git would most likely figure out how to handle that situation and merge the files for you to accommodate both changes. But if both users modified the same line in the same file, then a merge conflict arises and you will need to tell Git which change is to be accepted. Once everyone pushes their changes and all changes are merged together on the remote site, everyone can then pull the latest version from the remote site and now everyone has the latest copy of the application code that contains all changes made by all the other developers. So what is this remote Git repository and how do you set one up? One way to do this is to host a Git server. Identify a system and install Git on it the way you installed Git on your laptop. Git comes with a built-in command called git daemon that runs Git as a simple TCP server and that's all you really need to make a Git server. Or an alternate and more popular options are publicly hosted services like GitHub or GitLab. And they're absolutely free. You can install a private internally hosted version of GitLab within your network as well. So that's one of the common questions that we get asked. Like what's the difference between Git and GitHub? Git as we have been discussing, is the tool or the, the protocol or the version control system that helps us track and merge changes. And GitHub is the Git server that hosts remote repositories. As of January 2020, GitHub has over 40 million users and 100 million repositories. Source code of major open source projects are hosted on GitHub, such as Kubernetes or Node.js, Golang, or even Linux. Let's now go back to the original state where we started and view some commands that will help us achieve this. So now say that I was the original coder or the developer of the application and I have the source code of my application. And we learned that to convert this code to a Git repository, I must run the git init command and then we add all the files using the git add command and then commit uh, using the git commit uh, command. We must now push our code to the remote repository. For that, first you must create the remote repository. So if we are using GitHub, then create a new repository using the GitHub's web user interface. There should be a plus button at the top right. Click on that and then provide a repository name and description before clicking on the create repository button. You can choose to make it public or private. If made public, anyone can see the code in your repository. You'll have very similar option for other hosted repository solutions like GitLab or the others. Now we have a remote Git repository created and it appears under your profile on GitHub. Every repository on Git has its own unique URL that can be seen on this page. So we'll record that URL. The next step is to transfer our code from the local Git repository on my laptop to the remote Git repository on GitHub. For that, we must first let our local Git repository know that there is a remote Git repository that we want to push the code to. For that, use the command git remote add followed by a name for the remote repository and then the URL of the remote repository that we just saw when we created it on GitHub. Now, note that the name given here does not have to be the same name as that of the remote uh, repository. It is only for our own reference because we can have multiple such remote repositories configured and we can push the same code to all of these remote repositories. And when we do that, we need to know which remote repository we are pushing to. And that's why we must name them. For now, let's just focus on a single remote repository. Coming back, let's add a remote Git repository on our local repo to point to the GitHub URL Say for example, I have plans to have two remote repositories, one on GitHub and another on GitLab. So I'll name this one GitHub and provide the URL to the remote 
GitHub repository of mine. Just make sure you use a name uh, that you can differentiate when multiple repositories are configured. Once the remote repository is added, push the code from local to remote by running the git push command. Pass in the name of the remote repository and the branch name. We will talk about branches later, but for now, just know that the default branch is called the master. And you can specify that here. And since this is the first time we are pushing code, and since the master branch is not available on the remote site, you must specify the dash u option as well. Once run, all code from local is transferred to the remote site and is now available on GitHub. Once the code is available on the remote repo, how would others retrieve it? When another developer joins the team, how do they copy the code onto their laptops? For that, you pull the code down from the Git repo. If you don't have a local copy of the repository on your laptop already, as it is in this case for Mark, you must clone the repository first. Cloning downloads all the code and repository information from the remote repository to local. For this, we use the git clone command and specify the URL of the remote repository. Now, Mark can make changes to the repo and push their changes to the remote repo following the same commands that are listed here. Now, since Mark cloned the repository, he does not need to configure remote. The remote is automatically configured for him. Running the git remote-v command will list the remote repositories, and you can see that it's configured with a name origin. Origin is the default name given to a remote repository when it is cloned. It's short for original repository. If I were to push more changes in, for example, I modified the main.py file, staged and committed my changes, and then pushed them to the remote git repository, Mark can then get those new changes by pulling them. For this, use the git pull command. The git pull command only pulls the latest changes as opposed to cloning the entire repository. Well, that's it for now. Let's head over to the labs and practice working with git. Thank you for joining and good luck with the labs. Thank you.